This is the Savoy Express on XM track number four. On the invasion beachhead in northern France, it is now D-Day plus one, June 7th, 1944. The National Broadcasting Company interrupts all its programs to bring you a special broadcast. We take you now to London. Please, Sam. This is the advanced Allied command post of the invasion forces. Part of the amphibious forces which struck at France yesterday were manned by personnel of the United States Coast Guard. Covering them for the combined radio and press global pool was Mr. Tom Trainer, war correspondent of the Los Angeles Times. Mr. Trainer has just arrived at the command post from France after landing on the beachhead with the American Army units that the Coast Guard delivered into battle. He is here in the studio to give you his eyewitness report of the invasion. Mr. Trainer. I've just returned from France after hitchhiking on eight ships, mostly Coast Guard. Coast Guard craft seem to be all over the channel, snaking survivors out of the water, rushing wounded to first aid, and landing infantry and vehicles on the beach. I hit the beach myself early during D-Day when the Coast Guard cutter on which I was stationed went close ashore to pull aboard some men who had capsized in a duck. They came aboard shivering and shaking with cold, and as soon as they got below, proceeded to get seasick all over the place. I ceased interviewing them at this point and asked my skipper, Lieutenant Raymond Rosenblum of Baltimore, if he would hail a passing landing craft inward bound to the beach and put me aboard. The transfer was made, and my new skipper, Lieutenant Edward Raymond of Pittsburgh, said, I don't think we can get in. It's all these obstacles that are messing the thing up before we even get to the beach. I couldn't see any obstacles. That's the trouble, he said. Neither can we. The tide is running high, and they're covered. Those are heavy posts driven into the sand with booby traps attached. At low tide, we can avoid them. At high tide, you see, he pointed to various landing craft up and down the beach, which had been stove in and swung idly back and forth with the surf. They got us, he said. We prowled, up, we prowled up the coast a mile, looking for an opening, and then heard a loud hail behind us. A sleek-looking patrol craft slid by, and the skipper shouted, Hold off. Don't put your craft ashore until you get further orders. Now what, I asked Raymond. We'll see if we can get you on something smaller, he said. He got out his loud hailer and called a landing craft personnel, which was heading into the beach. Motor machinist mate John Kramer of Albany, New York, and seaman first class Jack Whitney of Columbus, Ohio, took me aboard. Okay, said Kramer to Whitney. Let's go and keep an eye out for the traps. We turned sliding and slewing in on some light breakers and grounded. I stepped ashore on France, walking up a beach where men were moving casually about, carrying equipment inshore. Up the coast a few hundred yards, German shells were pounding in regularly. But in our area, it was peacefully busy. How did you make out, I asked one of the men. It was reasonably soft, he said. The Germans had some machine gun posts and some high-velocity guns on the palisades and made it a little hot at first. They waited until a landing craft dropped their ramps, then opened up on them while the men were still inside. In a few cases, we took heavy casualties. Then the Navy went to work on the German guns, and it wasn't long before they were quiet. The general lack of fortifications at this point was astonishing. The barbed wire consisted of four single strands, such as we use at home to fence in cattle. A man could get through by pushing them down, pushing down on one wire and lifting up on another, providing they weren't booby trapped. The engineers and beach battalions, however, had blown gaps in the wire through which we could move vehicles. A few dead lay about, and some wounded were here and there on stretchers awaiting transfer to ships at sea. All up and down the broad beach, as far as I could see, men, jeeps, bulldozers, and other equipment were moving about like ants. A few columns of black, greasy smoke, smoke marked equipment which had been hit by shell fire and set afire. The German shelling continued steadily at various points up and down the beach, but so far not reached the area in which I was walking would work over an area, then move on to another. It was accurate, landing for the most part close to the water's edge, and I saw one small landing craft catch fire after taking a hit. Men came spilling out of it into water waist deep. From time to time, there were huge concussions as the engineers set off demolitions. The ground would shake, and the troops would throw themselves violently on the ground. I climbed a rock embankment and came to a piece of flat land where hundreds of men were digging foot trenches. When they got down about a foot and a half, they struck water. Some of them were lying in the water, and I asked if there was much shelling. There is when there is, one man said. Right now there isn't, but when it comes, it sure comes. I asked him what German fortifications he could point out. He showed me some tunnels at the top of the palisade. The palisade rises above the beach along this stretch of coast. There were five or six, I could, five or six positions I could make out, nothing particularly formidable. I walked over to an aerial which seemed to mark a command post. 
A colonel and a major were sitting beside a split trench half filled with water, and I said to the colonel, Sir, I'm a war correspondent. He looked up from a map fiercely, and the major said, I think you'd better stop back later. You might try going up that path there where you see those men. If you can make it, watch out for, our, watch out for mines. It's heavily mined. A long column of men was winding up the palisade on a narrow path. They weren't moving. At the skyline, they seemed to be knotted up. To reach the palisade, I joined a column who were wading across a slough. The water came nearly to their armpits, and they had to hold their rifles and equipments over their heads. The water was rather warm, but the bottom was a slimy mess. When a man got to the far side of the slough, he would always stop in a maddening way, holding the, holding the rest of us up. We shouted angrily, but when we got there, each one of us stopped too. The reeds on the far bank were loaded with mines. One man lay at the top of the bank, dead. The mines had been marked with bits of paper, and soldiers at the top advised just how to climb so as not to venture into dangerous ground. There were more dead men along the narrow path which led up the palisade. The column had stopped moving, and I began to step past men following a captain. Suddenly a voice said, Watch yourself, fellow, that's a mine. A soldier sprawled on the bank was speaking. He had one foot half blown off. He stepped on a mine a short time earlier. Now while he waited for litter bearers, he was warning other soldiers about other mines in that vicinity. I can stand the dead, but the wounded horrify me, and I only looked at him to thank him. He looked very tired, but perfectly collected. What you need is the medics, I said. I'll try and get them for you when I go back down. Yeah, he said, but how are they going to get up here? He was right. The pathway was so clogged with men and so heavily mined that it was impassable. The engineers would have to get up there first. The column didn't move forward. The captain I was following stopped, and so did I. I asked him his name, and he said he was Louis Hilly of Cincinnati. It looks like they shell around here a bit, I said, pointing to some shallow craters. No, said Hilly, those are all mine. That's why we're stuck on this path. We tried to edge a few feet further forward and came to a soldier lying in the path, curled around a mine. He said his name was Private Morton Soratello of the Bronx. And I asked him if it didn't make him nervous to be curled around a mine like that. No, he said, I just keep clear of it and pass the word on to those behind. Just ahead of him, Second Lieutenant Bernard Flynn of Springfield, Massachusetts, and Sergeant Arthur Brown of Brookfield, Maryland, were sitting in the immediate vicinity of mines, which they were calling to attention of all who passed. It's all right, except when a shell comes in, Flynn said. Then you're after forget and fall on the thing. While we were stopped there, a squib-like report sounded behind us. I thought it was a mortar going off, but Captain Hilly said it was a mine. He'd heard enough of them this day. At the top of the palisade, the knot of men had gotten to its feet, and it looked like the line might move. One man darted over the skyline, and almost immediately afterwards, we heard the speedy burst of a German machine gun. Then a few stray rifle shots. The bullets cracked overhead, and everyone ex instinctively ducked lower. These were some troops who had never seen combat before, and the bullets must have seemed close to them, although we were 100 feet below the skyline. The line remained stationary, and I looked down on the beach and the sea. Landing craft of all descriptions were sliding in through the low surf, disgorging men who moved through the water with amazing alacrity. As soon as they got ashore and saw the men moving about, Calmly, they seemed to steady down and began to walk quietly themselves. I waited a spell longer, and the line didn't move, so I began to make my way down the path again. It was slow work. The soldiers were so alarmed that I would step on a mine right next to them, and one man told me to walk on his back rather than step off the path. I promised I would try and get the engineers up to disarm the mines. While I was going down the slope, the Germans began shelling our area. It was hard not to throw myself on the ground willy-nilly, but the thought of those mines kept me from it. The shells were still landing at some distance on the flat. I took a last look at the greatest armada in history before going on the flat. It was, it was too immense to describe. There were so many transports on the horizon that in the faint haze they looked like a shoreline. Destroyers were almost on the beach, occasionally jolting out a salvo that was like a punch on the chin. Farther out, but still incredibly close to the beach, sat our huge battle wagons and cruisers. Overhead, formations of fighters swept swiftly through the air with nothing to do. During this entire day, I never saw a German plane, nor spoke to a man who had seen one. I reached a small command post on the flat, where a dispatch had just been handed two captains. It said that our troops were a mile inland, but we could still hear small arms fire. They were apparently being harassed by snipers, but so far it meant nothing heavy in the way of emplacements or, an, or an armored force. Just as I reached the beach, the German artillery came down in our earnest. I dived into a slip trench, but a man was in ahead of me, so I ducked under a bulldozer where I felt very safe. The only trouble was that I didn't want to get out from under the bulldozer after the shelling had stopped. The, the stuff was coming in close enough to send pebbles flying in, and I felt pretty badly shaken for a period. The first landing craft I boarded hung upon a sandbar. We had to unload and carry five stretcher cases through deep water to a second craft. Out in that great field of ships, it was like looking for a needle in a haystack to find my Coast Guard cutter. I never could locate it, 
but finally boarded another Coast Guard craft after transferring three times. Fortunately, it was the lead ship for the Coast Guard Rescue Flotilla, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Alexander Stewart of Mamaroneck, Long Island. We set off for England a few hours later, but a breakdown held us up, and we were 16 hours making the crossing. You have just heard an eyewitness report on the Coast Guard and American Army effort in the invasion beachhead by Mr. Tom Trainer, broadcasting... You've been listening to Tom Trainer of the Los Angeles Times, acting as special reporter for the National Broadcasting Company with the U.S. Coast Guard. Now back to NBC in New York. Hey. 